So this morning we are in the fourth week of our four-week series on values. And uh, before we jump into the fourth value, uh, I want to take some time and quickly recap uh, where we've been. So for those of you who have been following along, you know uh, that we uh, started this series uh, looking at our first value, which is we have good news. And we were in Ephesians chapter 2. Then in the second week, we looked at our second value, which is we are imperfect people. And we were in John chapter 8. Uh, then last week, we looked at our third value, which is we engage our culture. And that was coming from Acts chapter 17. And then this morning, we are looking at our fourth value, which is we are on mission. And we will also be addressing this value through the lens of Acts chapter 17. Now, for each one of these values, if you have been following along in this series, you know that we have provided essentially a summary, a paragraph summary of said value. And here is the value summary or the explanation of this fourth value. We take the Great Commission seriously. Jesus commanded us to go into all of the world and to make disciples. As a result, we are compelled as witnesses and ambassadors of Christ to demonstrate and declare the redeeming power of the gospel to a lost and broken world. That is the summary of our fourth and final value. Now, as we jump into this fourth and final value, like I already mentioned, we are going back into Acts chapter 17. And if you have your Bibles, um, I would love for you to turn to Acts 17, 16 through 34. Now, instead of reading it on the front end, because there's so many verses, we're going to read it as we go. But for those of you who were here last week, you know that essentially we said there are six steps that the Apostle Paul takes. But for the sake of time, I made it five uh, because uh, just, I just know myself. So we made it five instead of six. But last week, we looked at the first two steps that Paul took, which is he diagnosed the culture. Then he was disturbed by its condition. That was all one verse. I preached over an hour last week, and that was one verse. Uh, he saw, and he was provoked. That was the whole sermon. Uh, uh, I don't apologize for that, but uh, it's just it is what it is. <laughs> but today, we are going to look at the next three steps Paul took. After he diagnosed the culture, after he was disturbed by its condition, we see that Paul defended the gospel, then he declared the gospel, and then he dialogued the gospel. So we're going to work our way through each one of these. Now, before we jump into the three we're going to look at today, I want to quickly uh, provide a recap of what we discussed last week. For those of you who were here last week or maybe you were listening in online, you know that we covered a lot of content last week. So I want to create a, I want to give you a recap uh, for two reasons. One is because we covered a lot of stuff. But two, I feel that in order to pick up where we left off, we have to be reminded of where we were. Okay, so after preaching last week, I realized that at least as we were discussing the whole concept of first, second, third culture, I felt like it would be helpful if there was some sort of image or visual or graph of that for people who are more visual like me. And so I had someone who's way smarter than me create uh, an image for us. And uh, let me walk you through this. And this is essentially a summary of what we discussed last week. If we are going to engage our culture, we have to be able to distinguish the difference between a first culture, a second culture, and a third culture. And according to sociologist uh, Dr. Philip Reef, he says that these are the type of cultures that we see when we look at culture through the lens of religion, when we look at the religious underpinnings of said culture. He said the first type of culture that we see when we look at culture through this lens, is we see the first culture, which is a pre-Christian culture. Examples of a pre-Christian culture are Rome before Christianity, Athens before Paul, like we saw last week, America before the pilgrims, and India before William Carey. The characteristics of a first culture, of a pre-Christian culture, are paganism, polytheism, superstition, ritualism, spirits, gods, goddesses, and demons. Then he says, from there, once that culture has been evangelized, you get what is called the second culture. And we, essentially, the example we gave was Christendom. 
And Christendom, we said if Jesus founded Christianity, then Constantine founded Christendom. And so Christendom started in essentially 312 AD. It started when Constantine came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And it lasted all the way to the late 1950s. And it still exists in some places and pockets of the United States, i.e. Memphis. And examples of a second culture, of a Christian culture, are this. Or characteristics, I mean. Uh, monotheistic, so they believe in one God. Christian values, morals, and lifestyles. They believe in absolute truth. And the church of Jesus Christ is seen as necessary and good. Then, we said last week that our culture is moving more and more towards third culture. That's happening nationally. Like in Chicago, where I'm from, that's already happened. Um, but I would argue that in Memphis, it's starting to happen in places like Midtown and the University of Memphis. Here's what the third culture, here are examples of the third culture. is the majority of the Western world since the countercultural revolution of the 1960s. And here are the characteristics of a third culture, a post-Christian culture. It is defined against the second culture. It is literally react, reacting to and rebellion to the second culture. It is individualistic, deconstructive, secular, and relativistic. And in this post-Christian culture, the church is seen as unnecessary and bad. And then we look along the bottom. We talked about last week that one of the things that happens when a second culture seeks to evangelize a first culture, right? A Christian culture seeks to evangelize a pre-Christian culture. One of the risks is that that second culture accidentally, accidentally co colonizes and influences the pre-Christian culture, right? They bring their cultural values, things that are more American than they are Christian, right? And so the example I gave is that in Africa, you have uh, Africans who live like Africans from uh, Monday through Saturday, and then on Sunday, they put full-blown suits on in 120-degree weather and sing John Wesley hymns. That's called colonization, right? Well, what's interesting, if that's the risk that we are taking when we, as the second culture, attempt to reach a pre-Christian culture. What we see is the opposite is true when we try to reach a third culture. When someone from the second culture tries to evangelize the third culture, the post-Christian culture, the colonization happens in reverse. Instead of the Christian influencing the non-Christian, the non-Christian influences and colonizes them. That's the danger of the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. Now, I wrote a summary, essentially, of the, the sermon last week. I wrote a paragraph that I hope helps summarize what we discuss. Again, I do this not to recap, but I do this because it sets up where we're going today. Here is the summary of what we discovered last week. When we use the gospel as an external filter, we are better able to diagnose and embrace our current cultural moment. As our culture moves from a second culture, Christian, to a third culture post-Christian, the church of Jesus Christ will continue to become more and more marginalized socially, politically, intellectually, morally, and culturally. But instead of being anxious and threatened or angered about this cultural shift, we as the Western church should fully embrace it. Why? Because the less we rely on political, social, and financial power, the more we will be forced to rely on God's power and the more we will look like the global church. In other words, the more we embrace our roles as exiles and sojourners in this world, the more we will act like witnesses and ambassadors from another world. This next sentence is crucial. Once we accept that we are in Babylon and not the New Jerusalem, because America's Babylon, not the New Jerusalem, we will begin to seek the welfare of our city externally and give ourselves to the discipling of the next generation of Daniels internally. So in summary, we engage our culture by connecting to it, unlike those who isolate, by confronting it, unlike those who assimilate, and by converting it, unlike those who dominate. And in the words of the great Western theologian Tupac Shakur, <laughs> this is the realest thing I've ever wrote. So, now that we've set the framework, the foundation, 
for where we were. Now we can talk about where we are going. What we see here in the rest of Acts chapter 17 is that once given the opportunity, the Apostle Paul defended, declared, and dialogued the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first thing he does is he defended. Now, according to Randy Newman, uh, who is a, uh, essentially a, a, a Jew who became a Christian and uh, who does a lot of college ministry, in his book on evangelism, he says that there are three skills that a believer in our day needs to develop. Three skills. Uh, the first skill is the ability to defend the gospel. The second skill is the ability to declare the gospel. And then the third skill is the ability to dialogue the gospel. Now, this morning, we're not going to spend too much time on defend and declare because there's a good chance you've probably heard sermons on that before. We're going to spend most of our time this morning looking at the third skill, which is to dialogue the gospel. But I want to quickly cover the first two because I feel like it sets the stage for the third skill. So the step that we see Paul take here in Acts 17, is that when asked, he was ready to defend the gospel. Now, where do we see that? Well, look what it says in verse 19 through 22 of Acts 17. It says, and they took him. These are the Epicureans and the Stoics, right? We, we learned about them last week. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said. Now, let's pause there. What I want you to see here is that in this passage, the Apostle Paul is literally taken... And some commentators say that he could possibly have been taken by force. So it wasn't his choice. But he is taken and he is brought to speak in front of Mars Hill, the Areopagus. Right? And what I want you to see is that the Apostle Paul, when asked to, was ready and willing to defend his faith. So it wasn't like he told him, hey, wait here for a second. I got to go brush up on my apologetics. Give me a few minutes. I'll see you next week. Right? Give me a few days. No, no. We see that Paul was ready and able to defend his faith. And the, the term that is used to describe this skill of defending our faith is the word apologetics. And the, the root word of that word apologetics is Latin. And essentially it means a lawyer standing in front of a judge providing an intellectual and rational defense for something. That's where we get the word apologetics from. In other words, what we see is that apologetics is answering people's questions. We're going to see here in a little bit that uh, dialoguing the gospel is questioning people's answers. Defending the gospel is answering people's questions. It is responding to arguments that people might bring against Christianity. That's what it means to defend the gospel. That's what it means to participate in apologetics. Now, this isn't the only place in Scripture where we see this happening. In 1 Peter, here's what Peter writes in verse 13. He says this, Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, in the look at verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always, everyone say always, always. being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. That's what Peter says. And then Paul in Colossians 4 says this. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each 
person. See, so what we see is that not only does Paul model this for us, the, the ability and the skill to defend the gospel, but Peter and then Paul again in Colossians reaffirm that this is a skill that we as believers need in our current cultural moment. Now, there are tons of resources on apologetics, which is why we're not going to spend too much time on it today. Uh, but one of my favorite resources is CARM.org. Uh, Christian Apologetics Research Ministries. That website has tons of information and resources for you. Uh, but you can also buy Bible studies, like, like st study Bibles that are apologetic study Bibles. So depending on what part of Scripture you're looking at, it tells you how to defend that particular part of Scripture. And if you go looking for people who are great at this, I know Dr. William Lane Craig is amazing at this. Uh, Dr. John Lennox is great at this. Frank Turek is great at this. These are all different people who are excellent resources if you want to grow in your ability to defend the gospel. But here's what I would say. Even though apologetics is an essential and much needed skill in our day, I would argue that it is not sufficient. In other words, if all you know how to do is defend the gospel and all you know how to do is answer people's questions, even though it's a very important skill, I would argue that it is insufficient in our current cultural moment. And I'm going to explain to you in a little bit why I believe that's the case. So we see Paul defend the gospel. Then the next thing Paul does is he declares the gospel. Now, where do we see that? Well, look what it says in verse 22 through 31. It says, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So what we see here in this section is that the Apostle Paul not only is ready and able to defend the gospel, but then he clearly then communicates. He declares the gospel. And as we read through his speech, through his sermon, what we see is that he covers all the essential ingredients of a biblical presentation of the gospel. He makes sure to include all the crucial components that are needed in order to biblically communicate the gospel, the full gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, before we jump into what Paul actually said, let me, let me stop here for a second and, uh, and say this. If you just read what Paul wrote, it probably will take you about a minute and 30 seconds to two minutes to read what he wrote. I say that because what commentators say is that there's a very good chance Paul didn't just speak for two minutes. He got an opportunity to speak to these very influential intellectuals. He didn't just get up and give a two-minute talk, right? So what, the reason why that's important is because there's a good chance that there was more than that Paul said. We got a summary of what he said. And, and why do I bring that up? Well, we know that he said more because there are certain things he couldn't have brought up if he hadn't brought up the thing that preceded it. So, for example, you can't bring up resurrection unless you bring up crucifixion, right? You can't bring up judgment unless you bring up salvation. And so even though he never mentions the crucifixion specifically, 
we know he had to bring it up at some point because you can't bring up that Jesus resurrected if you didn't talk about Jesus dying. Okay? Now, why is that important? Well, because certain commentators did something that really, really irked me. At the end of the passage, you see that most of the people sneered at him. Most of the people ridiculed him. They laughed at him. So just for those people who think that uh, us modern people are so sophisticated and that people from Bible times were just, they just believed anything. Well, no, because most people laughed at him, sneered at him. Just like the culture does today, they were doing it back then. Some wanted to continue the conversation and then some came to know Jesus. But here's why I bring that up. What some commentators argue is that the reason why so many people didn't respond was because Paul didn't give a clear enough presentation. So they blame Paul for the response he got. Here's why I struggle with that. Because biblically, I can't save your soul. That is a work of God. And so when those commentators blame Paul, oh, well, he didn't say this. If it was me, I would have said this. No, if it was you, you probably never would have been in Athens to begin with. Or you'd be sightseeing instead of soul saving. And it bothers me because they make it seem like it's Paul's fault. Why people didn't respond. Our job is to faithfully declare the good news of the gospel. Amen. To cast the seeds of the gospel. I can't control the condition of the soil of your heart. All I can do is cast the seed. God is sovereign over the the ground of your heart and over the growth of the seed, not me. And so it bothers me when commentators try to blame Paul for the lack of response because Paul left with no guilt whatsoever. That man kept on with his ministry. He didn't sit there, oh man, we got to pray for a rival here in Athens. I didn't do my job. It, no, took no blame whatsoever because if you take blame, if you take credit for the salvations, then you'll take blame for the lack of conversion. That's what churches do, right? They like taking credit when people respond, but then when you do that, you have to take blame when they don't. In the sermon, Paul exposes the sin of man and he exalts the salvation that comes from God. He talks about God and his work in the past tense, in the present tense, and in the future tense. He, he, di he displays God as creator, as sustainer, as redeemer, and as judge. We see him in the passage. He uses natural revelation to then lead them towards special revelation. What's natural revelation? Natural revelation, according to Scripture, is creation. What we can know about God from creation. It also includes human consciences. So he uses the conscience because he says, I see that you are very religious people. Then he uses the altar to the unknown God to then build a bridge and share the gospel. But he uses natural revelation, what can be known about God in creation. Then he shifts gears and leads towards special revelation, which is God's word, God's work, God's son. We see Paul do it in a very masterful way, I might add. And he wants them to see that this God, this unknown God that they have an altar to, on the one hand, is more transcendent than they ever imagined. And yet, on the other hand, he's more imminent than they ever had hoped. That he is creator, and so he's above creation, and yet he incarnated and became one of us. That's what we see. He goes out of his way to explain, he, it's, it's masterful, like, I don't have time, but the way Paul preaches this is masterful. He, he goes out of his way to interweave throughout the whole message the bad news of sin, the bad news of idolatry. And then again and again, he continues to give them the good news of the gospel. And then at the end, like a good gospel presentation, he calls for repentance. And so what we see here is that the apostle Paul has the skill, has the ability to declare the gospel. He is given the opportunity and he is able to declare the gospel. But I would argue that we as believers cannot declare the gospel to others if we don't know the gospel ourselves. And that's why this skill is such an important skill. So we see him defend the gospel. We see him declare the gospel. 
And then the third and final thing that Paul does is he dialogues the gospel. He dialogues it. This is where we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning. Because like I said, there's a good chance you've probably heard a sermon on defending and on declaring. Uh, but this is a skill that is often overlooked. As a matter of fact, Randy Newman in that book I mentioned earlier, he talks about how this skill, the skill of dialoguing the gospel, is quite literally the most overlooked and most underutilized skill in our repertoire. We don't go there and use this skill as often as we should. So the question is, well, actually, before I read, let me say this. I would argue that the reason why Paul is given the opportunity to defend the gospel and to declare the gospel is because he first dialogued the gospel. Him dialoguing the gospel earned him the right to defend it and to declare. But many of us want to defend the gospel. We want to declare the gospel. We want to do drive-by evangelism. But what we see is that the dialoguing is what gives us and grants us permission to defend and to declare. Now, where do we see Paul doing this? Well, look what it says in verse 16. It says, now, while, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Verse 17. So he reasoned. Everybody say reasoned. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Paul sees the idols. He is provoked. That's what we talked about last week. And Dr. John Stott essentially argues that the reason why we don't respond the way Paul responds is because we don't see what Paul sees. We aren't using a gospel filter when we evaluate the culture around us. And leave it up to me to quote John Stott and Tupac in the same sermon. But like I said, go figure. But that's what John Stott says. We don't react the way Paul reacts because we don't see what Paul sees. You see, but once we do, we see that Paul doesn't isolate. He doesn't assimilate. He doesn't dominate. But instead, he decides to clearly and compellingly communicate the good news of the gospel. And you might be asking, how does he do it? Well, according to Luke, he did it by reasoning with the Athenians, by reasoning with the Epicureans, by reasoning with the Stoics. Now, the Greek word there, reasoning or reasoned, the Greek word there is the word dialogos. It's where we get the word dialogue in English. And here's what it means in Greek. It means to have a conversation with someone. It means to have a deep discussion with someone. And it means, get this, to question not just them, but yourself. As a matter of fact, the other times in scripture where this Greek word dialogos is used, is used to describe people who are questioning themselves. It says that the religious leaders heard what Jesus said and they questioned themselves. That's what the word there dialogos means. Not just to question someone else, but to question your questions. That's why if you're sitting here today and you're a skeptic and Christianity seems unreasonable to you, I'm not saying don't have doubt. I'm just saying that you should doubt your doubt. Doubt the doubt just as much as you doubt the truth. And I don't think the doubt's going to be able to hold up against the interrogation. Here's what's interesting about this Greek word, dialogos. I think that when we think, oh, well, that just means to dialogue. I know what that means. No, I think when we do that, we actually take away from what it actually means in Greek. You see, because in those days when they talked about dialogos, reasoning, they were talking about a very specific type of reasoning. They were talking about Socratic reasoning, Socrates. Here's why Socratic reasoning was so different from the type of reasoning that we do in our day. Instead of answering questions, which is defending the gospel, Socratic reasoning is all about questioning answers. It's about asking questions in order to truly and genuinely understand the position of the person you are talking to. It's a genuine and empathetic approach to a person. 
right? Because a lot of times when we're in a debate or in a conversation, this could be with our spouse, our kids, our friends, our parents. We're not really listening to them. Like they're talking and they're like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. You done? Okay, cool. Let me say what I want to say then. That's not dialogos. Dialogos is a genuine, authentic empathy that listens for the purpose of understanding the worldview and the position of the person you are talking to. It takes humility. It takes gentleness. It takes patience. All the things that the church lacks. That's what it means to dialogos, to have an actual conversation. And here's what's fascinating about this approach. Once you fully understand their worldview, their position, then you argue or respond, if you will, not by pushing your views, but by taking their own premises or premises, truth claims, and literally walking them to their logical conclusion. It's taking what, okay, this is what you believe, cool. Let's take that to its logical conclusion and let me show you how it actually doesn't do what you think it does. Your worldview actually cannot carry the weight of your life. That's what it means to dialogos, to reason with people. Uh, Randy Newman in his book says this, speaking on this question-based approach. He says, a better way exists, and it looks, sounds, and feels more like Jesus the rabbi than like Murray the used car salesman. It it involves more listening than speaking, inviting rather than demanding a decision. And then he says, perhaps the most important component of this kind of evangelism is answering questions with questions rather than giving answers. This is not just the example that Paul gives. When you look at the ministry of Jesus, Jesus does this again and again. If you read through the Gospels, almost always Jesus answers questions with questions. So the rich young ruler says, what must I do to be saved? Good teacher. And I know if that was me, like if I was sitting up here as their service and the rich young ruler came up to me and asked me that question, it'd be like, this is T-ball. The ball is set up. I just got to hit it out of the park. Done. Notch on my belt. Jesus responds to his question with a question. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Why? Because Jesus knew that he didn't think Jesus was God. He just thought Jesus was just another run-of-the-mill prophet. And Jesus can't be your savior if he isn't God. Jesus exposes him by answering him a question, answering his question with a question. And then in doing so, he exposes that his real God wasn't Jesus, it was money. And when Jesus tells him to sell it, he walks away sad. We see Jesus answering questions with questions. But we also see it happen when the Pharisees try to trap him. The the Pharisees come up with it to him and they have a, a coin. They're like, should we pay taxes to Caesar, yes or no? Jesus could have answered. Isn't it funny that the person who had all the answers asked questions? And the people who have none of the answers try to give answers? And Jesus says, well, what's the inscription on the coin? Well, it's Caesar's. He says, give to Caesar what is made in his image and give to God what's made in his image, which is a fascinating statement because Jesus says, if that's what's made in his image, give it back to him. But give to God what's made in his image. What's made in God's image? Us. So you can give government its proper place, but don't ever give government your heart. Don't ever give politics your heart because you belong to God. Questions with questions. That's how Jesus approached it. As a matter of fact, we always talk about that, that moment in the, in the ministry of Peter when he declares Jesus is the Messiah. Well, the only reason why he did it is because Jesus gets the disciples alone and says, who do people say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? It, the whole conversation is based on a question that Jesus asked. He didn't just question those who were on the outside. He even questioned those who were on the inside. Jesus had a question-based approach. He just did. 
And here's something I want to say that I don't want to forget. Here's why this approach, this type of evangelism, is needed in our day. Because what I like about this skill of dialoguing the gospel is that it allows you to be more flexible and versatile in your presentation of the gospel. Because here's how we usually have taught people to evangelize. We tell them to defend the gospel. We tell them to declare the gospel. But really what we do is essentially it's kind of like Taekwondo. It's like, hey, when you are fighting, if someone tries to punch you with a right hook, you block it like this. And then you block it like that. The problem is if anyone's ever been in an actual fight in a back alley, I don't know if you've ever been in a fight before, but you can't tell the person, hey, hey, can we do that over again? Can you punch me from this angle? Because that's the only thing I know how to block. No, it doesn't work. Right? It doesn't work in real life. I think what this approach does is it allows us not to be uh, Taekwondo artists. It allows us to be Judo artists. That's the martial art that Steven Seagal made famous. Shout out to Steven, man. I don't know where he's at, but shout out to Steven. (laughs) But what is judo? Judo is when I use your energy, your momentum against you. So you swing with everything you got, and then I use your energy and power against you. This is the judo approach. And it works much better in the world we live in. So then you don't have to sit there and awkwardly ask people to start over again because you don't know how to answer their questions. Let me work through some of the reasons why I think this skill is needed. There are several, so bear with me. One of the reasons why I think this skill is so needed is because it allows us and enables us uh, to build bridges of commonality instead of dividing lines of division, instead of drawing lines of division. It allows us to build bridges of commonality instead of drawing lines of division. It allows us to see those interactions not as arguments to win, not as deals to close, but as people to love. Like those are actual human beings who are made in the image of God, who without him are dying and going to hell. And it allows us to view them as people to love. One pastor I looked at said this. I read this several years ago, but he said this. He said, every truth claim... There's three ways that we can, reject, we can react to every truth claim. The first way you can react to a truth claim is to receive it. It biblically is true. It lines up with what Scripture says, so you can just fully receive it, right? The second way you can react to a truth claim is you can redeem it. If there's something or part of it that's true, you can redeem it. But if a truth claim is not biblical at all, there's not even a hint of it, then you reject it. So you can receive redeem or reject but a lot of times as believers we only do the the two the number one number three we either receive it because it's fully biblical or we reject it because it's not biblical at all but many times when you are interacting with someone especially if they are from the third culture right because they want they have the kingdom without a king they have the values without the view they have the lifestyle without the lord many times they will say things that are partially true. So what you do is you don't receive it fully, you don't reject it fully, but you redeem it and you allow that to be the bridge that you use to build commonality with that person. I'll give you an example of how me, why defending and uh, declaring aren't enough. I have a cousin of mine and several years ago, uh, I had an opportunity I don't know how the conversation came up. And I can share this story because I know there's no way that she's watching this right now. She is very, very pagan and not, not, doesn't believe in God at all. And we had an opportunity to talk. And I forgot how it all happened, but essentially we started to have a, it was an evangelistic conversation. And one of the things that surprised me was how little she knew about her worldview. Like I knew more about her worldview than she did. And everything she would throw at me, I would just, you know, she would pull and I'd be like, pull, poof. Pull, boof. Every argument, I obliterated it, right? And as the conversation went on, I can see her heart getting more and more distant from me. And by the time we ended, she walked away angry, offended, 
and super annoyed by me. And I left that conversation. I drove home that day thinking, I just won an argument. But I might have pushed someone away from Christianity forever. The question you have to ask yourself is, do you want to win an argument or do you want someone to meet Jesus? That's why this skill is so vital and so necessary. Here's the other reason why I think this skill is so important. Because dialoguing with people, questioning people, seeking to understand people is radically different from the culture that we live in. We live in a culture that is marked not by face-to-face conversations, but by online confrontations. We have a culture that is very triggered, and when triggered, cancels you immediately. And this isn't just one side of the aisle, this is both sides of the aisle. Both sides are triggered. Both sides cancel. I don't know about you, but I've never in my life have been on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook and have seen a full-blown debate happen on social media in the comment section and one person admit they were wrong. Like, you know what? Never thought of it that way. Thanks for sharing. I have repented and believed the gospel. No, it never works. Because that forum is not for conversation. It is for confrontation. So no one will ever admit that they're wrong. It just solidifies the position you've already chosen. This is why I think apologetics, again, I love it and it's needed. But most of the examples that we have of apologetics are debates on YouTube. You give your argument, I give my argument. That's not real life. No one's sitting at Starbucks saying, I can't wait to debate someone today. (laughs) Those are two people who have pre-agreed beforehand they're going to debate a concept. And even then, I've never seen someone on the other side say, never thought of it that way. I'm praying to receive Jesus right now. Because that's not the point of debate. That's the issue. This is why I think this approach is so important. Because here's the thing, this is a phenomenon that has happened in our culture that we all do. In our culture, you can curate the news you receive, the information that is sent your way. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is if someone triggers you or offends you, you just cancel them. You just stop following them. You just don't watch them anymore. You don't listen to that podcast anymore. And so what happens is since you can curate the news you receive, you literally start believing that everyone in the world thinks what you think. Because that's the only news you receive, right? And what happens is a lot of Christians go out into the world, and this is true of the whole world, not just Christians. In our culture, people don't, are, don't really want information. What they're looking for is affirmation. Information is when I have an open mind and I want to learn about something. Affirmation is when I've already made my decision and I just need people to tell me I was right. We live in an affirmation culture, not in an information culture. And that's why this skill is so important because it forces us and it forces said individual to have a conversation. Here's the other reason why this skill is so needed and why, again, nothing against apologetics, but why I think defending the gospel is not sufficient in our day. Many times the reason why people don't embrace Christianity is not because they have an unconvinced head, but because they have an unconverted heart. You see, the assumption with apologetics is, oh, if I just answer all your questions, eventually you're going to just receive it. But if the person is spiritually dead, it's not just an unconvinced head. It's an unconverted heart that's keeping them from believing what you are saying. That's why uh, Dr. Dallas Willard, the late Dallas Willard, he said this. He said, sometimes the best question you can ask someone that you are seeking to evangelize, especially if you've been talking to them for a long time about it, is ask him, if one day I am able to prove that Christianity is true, if one day I am able to answer all your questions, would you believe it? Yes or no? And if their answer is no, then you know it's over. You keep praying for them. But if they tell you, it doesn't matter if you answer all my questions. I'm never going to believe it. Then you see their problem is not an unconvinced head. It's an unconverted heart. Sometimes that's the best question you can ask someone. You always have all these questions, but if I answer all of them, would you believe? No. Cool, then I'll pray for you, man. I'll pray for God to change the soil of your heart. 
Because clearly you're not ready to receive the gospel seeds. You see the difference? As a matter of fact, I, I remember years ago, I tried to look for it, but I, I, can't, I couldn't figure out what book it was in. But in, in the book, it was an atheist who became a Christian. And he said, for a long time, the Christians who tried to evangelize me kept trying to convince my head. Like, give me truth to believe. He's like, but what they didn't know was that what was keeping me from Christianity wasn't intellectual thoughts. It was that I didn't want to stop sleeping with my girlfriend. Right? Sometimes it's not an intellectual issue. It's a moral issue. They don't want Jesus as the Lord of their life because they see the fine print and they're like, no, I'm good. That, that's what we see in the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. And I would argue that this is even more true in light of what we discussed last week. We said last week that because we live in a third culture, our culture is moving from second to third. You have people who have the kingdom without a king. They, are, they don't want to buy the cow because they're already getting the milk. They want the lifestyle without the Lord. So when you come to them and you g declare the gospel, they're like, oh, I believe in justice too. I believe in equality too. I believe in loving your neighbor too. That's the difficulty of our culture. Remember what we said about the third culture. A third culture stands in reaction to, in rebellion to. It defines itself against the second culture. It has the lifestyle without the Lord, the kingdom without the king. And so here's what John Piper says about the current cultural moment that we find ourselves in. Dr. John Piper says this. Inoculation introduces a mild form of a disease into a body, thereby stimulating the growth of antibodies and rendering the person immune to getting a full-blown version of the sickness. In the same way, post-Christian society contains unique resistance and antibodies against full-blown Christianity. In a society like ours, most people only know of either a very mild and nominal Christianity or a separatist, legalistic Christianity. Neither of these, of these is, may we say, the real thing. But exposure to them creates spiritual antibodies, as it were, making the listener extremely resistant to the gospel. These antibodies are now everywhere in our society. This is why we have to question answers before we answer questions. There, there's essentially two ways I can blow up a boulder. I've used this illustration before, but I'll use it again. I can just take dynamite and put, on top, put it on top of the boulder and hope that it blows a part of it up, right? But if I really want to do something about the boulder, I got to drill into the boulder and put the dynamite inside the boulder. That's what questioning does. That's what dialoguing does. It allows you to drill into their worldview, and then you put the gospel right in the middle of it. That's why this skill is so important. Here's the other thing, reason why uh, exposing, uh, approaching, the, approaching it this way is so important. Because when you take a dialogue approach, you allow them to see the inconsistencies of their worldview. You do what the Socratic reasoning says. You step into their world and you take their logic and lead it to its logical conclusion. Okay? Because what we see Paul do here, Paul doesn't, a lot of Christians will say this. Hey, turn your brain off and just have faith. When you're a Christian, you don't, we, we don't think here. We're Christians. Not Paul. Paul didn't turn his brain off. He turned his brain on. He had a rational conversation with these people. He went the fact approach, not the faith approach. Here's how one pastor put it. He says, every worldview is like an outfit. It's like a set of clothes that you put on. The problem with our culture, though, is that they pick one part of an outfit from over there and one part of an outfit from over there, and they put on their worldview and don't see the inconsistencies. Their outfit doesn't match. But since no one is asking about it, they think they're incredibly consistent people. Here's the thing about an outfit or a, a, a wardrobe that isn't a biblical worldview. Any other worldview outside of a biblical, gospel-centered worldview, there are certain parts of the outfit that just don't fit right. It can't cover your whole body, as it were. And so certain topics, 
the, the, the outfit starts to get tight. It starts to pinch them. And in some cases, the outfit just rips because they can't carry the weight of whatever area that is, which is why the postmodern culture struggles with suffering so much. They don't have an answer for it. It doesn't fit their worldview. And so when certain topics come up, their outfit rips. It gets tight. It pinches them. And it gives us opportunities to step in and show them their worldview cannot carry the weight of their lives. Yeah, it can carry your life when things are great. But what happens when someone you love dies? That's what we see. Here's the thing. Here's, what, here's what's so important. So often uh, Christians, they, they spend all, here's what, what evangelism looks like in your life, right? You're, you're like a catcher and they're the pitcher. And, and they're just throwing pitches and you're, you're trying to guess where the pitch is going. What type of pitch is it? Let, let me catch it. Okay, let me answer that question. Okay, let me answer this question. Let me answer that question. And then a lot of times after you have an evangelism in, encounter, you get in your car and you're like, dang it, I should have said this. I should have quoted that. This would have been a way better answer. And you walk away with all this guilt because you didn't do it right. But here's the thing. According to Matthew chapter 7, the person who's built their house on the rock is you. They're the ones who are built on sand. So instead of spending all your time defending the rock, spend your time exposing the sand. Jesus says that you will know what your life is built on when the storms come. When you question someone, you essentially bring a metaphorical storm, an intellectual storm, and then they start to see that this sand that they're building their life on isn't as firm as they thought. And then you can get in your car and drive home and not feel guilty because all you did was question their answers, not try to answer their questions. Because many times their questions aren't really their questions. It's a heart thing, not a head thing. Sometimes the best way to move someone from point A to point B is not telling them how great point B is, is by telling them how bad point A is. It's almost like every worldview is like a puzzle. And, and once you choose a worldview, you, you put like the outline of it. You know how most people, when they do a puzzle, they, they put the outline of it first. There are certain puzzle pieces in the postmodern secular worldview that just don't fit. It's too small. Our job is to take those puzzle pieces and say, the reason why it doesn't fit is because your worldview ain't it. The only puzzle that can fit this piece is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But instead of telling them how great your puzzle is, show them how insufficient their puzzle is. Let me give you an example of some of the things that our culture says that are just so ridiculous, but we just accept them. We just, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? So for example, our culture will say things like, there is no such thing as absolute truth. No such thing. What's an absolute truth? A truth that's true all the time. An absolute truth, right? Something that's true, absolutely. The problem with the statement when someone says there's no such thing as an absolute truth is that statement is an absolute truth. That's inconvenient. Or when our culture says, I, you shouldn't be imposing your views on people. You shouldn't be evangelizing. Well, what's interesting is that you are evangelizing against non-evangelizing. You are imposing your view on me, telling me not to impose my view. They are doing the very thing they're telling you not to do. Or for example, when our culture, this is so interesting, we have like a, and I, and I don't say this to minimize the, the mental condition, but we almost have a, a schizophrenic culture where on the one hand, you see them say, well, there's no such thing as right and wrong. You can live however you want. You are self-ruled. You are self-sufficient. You come up with your own truth and your own standards of right and wrong. I have no right to judge your sexuality or your, your decision-making. You, you, there's no such thing as right and wrong. That's one week. The very next week on social media or through whatever newspaper you follow or channel you watch, they will turn around and say, oh, what's happening in Afghanistan is wrong. That is objectively wrong. Really? Hold on. So it either, either you believe in truth or you don't. Either there is right and wrong or there isn't right and wrong. But you can't pick, oh, here there is no right and wrong, but over there is right and wrong. That's the world we live in, though. But if we don't expose that through dialoguing, 
They're just going to keep believing the lies. Another one is this. I believe that we come from nothing and that when we die, we go to nothing. But the in-between means something. No. You can't do that. You can't come from nothing and then when you die, go to nothing and say, oh, no, but this means something. No, if you really believe that, follow your logic to its ultimate conclusion and you will be a very depressed person. Because there is no meaning here if we come from nothing and go to nothing. Again, they hijack Christian values. They hijack the lifestyle but reject the Lord. We have to expose that. We can't just let people sit there and then be the ones defending all the time. They're the ones on sand, not us. C.S. Lewis says this about the inconsistencies of people's worldviews. Get this. This was written decades ago, people. And he writes this. This is from the screw tape letters, which is where one older demon is mentoring a younger demon, telling him how to keep his subject from ever believing in Jesus. Look at the advice he gives him. This is decades ago. He says this. It sounds as if you suppose that argument was the way to keep him out of the enemy's clutches, the enemy being God. That might have been so if he had lived a few centuries earlier. At that time, the humans still knew pretty well when a thing was proved and when it was not. And if it was proved, they believed it. They still connected thinking with doing and were prepared to alter their way of life as a result of a chain of reasoning. But what with, but what with the weekly press and other such weapons? We have largely, but, yeah, but with the weekly press and other such weapons, we have largely altered that. Listen to this. Your man, this person, has been accustomed ever since he was a boy to have a dozen incompatible philosophies dancing about together inside his head. He doesn't think of doctrines as primarily true or false, but as academic or practical, outworn or contemporary, conventional or ruthless. And then he says this, jargon, not argument, is your best ally in keeping him from the church. The trouble about argument is that it moves the whole struggle onto the enemy's own ground. That's the culture we live in. I'm going to share a couple stories here and then I'll conclude. In his book, he says this. Newman, he says this. He says that when he started reading scripture and learning how to question instead of answer, he said, in looking at the life of Jesus, says there were multiple times where he could have gone one way and instead went another. So he said he was teaching his Bible study one time, and three atheists show up, and they were militant atheists. They were trying to take over the Bible study. And at one point during the Bible study, he was like, he mentioned hell, and one of the atheists started scoffing. And he's like, wait, 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 wait. You mean to tell me you guys still believe in hell? And Newman says that the old him would have tried to give him all this biblical rationale for hell, right? The old him would have started giving answers. But instead, he said this. He asked him this question. He said, do you even believe in hell? And the guy's like, well, I guess not. He's like, well, why are you so bothered by it then? And it opened up a whole other conversation. Then in another instance, he said that he was giving this debate, and it was a debate on suffering, and they were debating the Christian answer to suffering, or answers to suffering. And it was him versus this secular professor that was on campus. And after the debate, they sat down for lunch and the secular atheist professor was like, you know what, I still don't think that the Christian answer for suffering is sufficient. And he said that everything in him wanted to give him the, this rationale. And he was like, well, let me ask you this. What's your answer to suffering? He said the guy got super quiet. He said, well, I guess I don't have one. We're not the ones on sand, people. And maybe up to this point, you've thought, I can't be an evangelist because I'm not a talker. I'm an introvert. I'm more of a question asker than an answer giver. Well, guess what? So is Jesus. This, I don't know about you, but this frees me to want to be more missional. That's what we see. Ask people, what, what is your answer to purpose, identity? How do you deal with guilt, shame? How do you rationalize reconciliation and justice? Like what? How did you get there? What book did you read? What person did you listen to? Why do you believe that? Let them give the answer. 
Here's the thing. At the end of the day, we cannot use the gospel externally with others if we don't use it internally with ourselves. I believe that the reason why we don't dialogue the gospel with others is because we don't dialogue the gospel in ourselves. I told my wife this the other day. I said, I realize in my heart, I'm like the grace guy, right? I preach grace every week. And I realize I give everyone else grace. But I rarely give myself grace. Like when I look at my life, I'm pretty much a law guy. Performance guy, law, ladder climbing guy. And I give grace to everybody else except myself. And then I was meeting with a friend of mine this week and he said something. He said, here's the thing about grace. This is just blew my mind. I'll never forget this. I told him what I was struggling with and he said this. He said, grace is useless unless you need it. Grace only works if you need it. If you don't need it, you don't get it. And that's why, like we said last week, I think our job as the church is to use the gospel to evaluate ourselves so that then we might turn around and use the gospel to evaluate our culture. And instead of fighting the cultural moment that we have found ourselves in, we should embrace the fact that we are on the periphery of culture, that we are exiles. And that instead of relying on political and financial and social power, we as the church might rely on the power of God. And that we would give ourselves to rely on God's message, God's mission, and God's might. And that we would focus on discipling, quite literally counter-catechizing. The world's catechizing us. Remember what we said, influence. Discipling and counter-catechizing the people in our church. So that we might become gospel-saturated, mission-minded people who follow Christ, are being formed by Christ, and then go out to fish for Christ, not by isolating, assimilating, or dominating, but by communicating in a compelling and clear way the good news of the gospel. And I am convinced that the better we get at dialoguing the gospel, the more opportunities we will be given to defend it and to declare it. Amen?